locked in an ugly confrontation with Khartoum. Are you surprised? No, not at all. I mean, the current situation was to be expected, given the fact that uh, there's a lot of unfinished business in terms of the implementation of the comprehensive peace agreement. Uh, the National Congress Party regime in Khartoum signed up to certain commitments under the comprehensive peace agreement, uh, implemented part of those commitments, but reneged on some of the most important ones, uh, in particular the demarcation of the border uh, on the basis of the 11956 borderline. Now, there is a fundamental misconception about uh, the, the 11956 borderline. Well, uh, that, let, let's not get too technical too early. It just strikes me, even as you refer to this unfinished business, that it was probably deeply premature, maybe even crazy, to declare statehood to sort of oversee this independence when, as you've just said, you didn't have demarcated borders, you had major territorial disputes, you hadn't settled who owned the oil and who was going to receive the payments for the oil. All these key issues were left unresolved. So why did you, in a sense, think nationhood could work? Yeah, simply because from the word go, I think Khartoum was intent on frustrating the will of the people of South Sudan. They never wanted the referendum to take place, especially after it became quite clear that the majority of the people of South Sudan were going to vote for statehood. And uh, the issue of the borders, for instance, uh, the borders were supposed to be demarcated during the pre-interim period. That is six months before the onset of the interim period proper. But Khartoum dragged its feet and it never wanted to, to do this. Uh, because Khartoum understands that on the basis of the 11956 borderline, if you applied that as the criterion for determining where disputed or contested areas fall, then it would lose all the currently contested areas without exception, including well, of course, Kigli. Yes, of course, it's not so clear cut when you look at it from Khartoum. Their view of, of where the border lies and what the history tells us about that border is very different. But before we get there, let's just talk about what has happened in recent weeks because that's where the international focus is right now. Would you accept? given what has happened in recent weeks, that your military forces from South Sudan uh, fairly catastrophically overplayed their hand when they pushed all the way into the town and the uh, surrounding region of Heglig. Let me give you just a little background about Heglig. Heglig, which is actually called Panthor by the indigenous people of the region, is part so to of... To be clear to people who, don't, who aren't familiar with the map, yes. Heglig, or Panthu, whatever you call it, it is close to the dispute, disputed border. It is an oil town and an oil region, and it is, if we are honest about it, widely regarded, and certainly regarded in Khartoum, as northern territory. And your troops crossed across, uh, went across the notional demarcation line and occupied the town. First of all, we did not actually occupy the town. Actually, we went into the town by default, you see, because when we went to Higlid, that was the third time in a row that Higlid was used as a base to launch attacks against our forces deep inside South Sudan. So when we repulsed the third and the final attack, uh, the, the fleeing attackers did not stop at Higlid and reorganize and take up defensive positions. They just kept on going. And so we found ourselves in Higlid as an occupied town. But Higlid belongs to South Sudan. It was transferred to the north only in the late 70s when oil was discovered there uh, by the Nimeri regime. Because again, as I said, if you go by the criteria of the 111956 borderline, which has not yet been agreed, but the parties, uh, the South and the North, agree that it is going to mark their international boundary. Higlik and all the other disputed areas would fall south of that Well, I, I suspected we might get into a complicated <coughs> debate about where borders fall, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. All I will say is this, that the International Court of Arbitration, which you agreed to go to and to be bound by its results in 2009, drew up a map which suggested quite clearly that Higlik was going to fall on the northern side of the border. Again, that is also a mischaracterization of what happened with the PCA ruling. The PCA ruling was not on Higlig, it was on Abyei. No, I the, know, but yeah. as a result, Higlig was said to be not in Abyei, and as a result, it was therefore uh, widely seen across yeah. the international community that Higlig was going to belong to the north, to Sudan. But Higlig not belonging to Abyei does not automatically imply that it falls in the north, and there was no explicit statement in the PC award saying that well, we, we, we part probably could discuss this till kingdom come this is in the end has got to be something that you sort out with the government in Khartoum yeah. nobody else yeah. can sort it out yeah. but what is clear is that as a result of your troops pushing into Higlig you can characterize it how you like but that's what happened you have lost a lot of international support UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon he said the act was an infringement on the sovereignty of Sudan and it was a clearly 
illegal act. Yes, but those comments, again, as I said, are based on a misunderstanding of the status of Higlik. The reason we went into Higlik was not because we wanted to assert our claim by military means. We wanted to neutralize Higlik that was being used as a threat as a base to attack us. Well, you, you may have your reasons, but I, I want you to address this point, that South Sudan, in the nine or ten months of its existence, seems to have lost a lot of international sympathy because of some of the actions you've taken, and perhaps number one of those actions was the decision to put your troops all the way into Higlik. Do you regret it? As I said, we didn't go into Higlik intentionally. We, we went into, we, we found ourselves in occupation of Higlik. It was a mistake. Not by design. Because you're saying it, it wasn't by intentional. Default. Are you yeah. sort of tacitly now acknowledging to me, Foreign Minister, that it was a mistake? I don't think it is a mistake because fundamentally we do not want to, to, to claim our territories by, by military means. We are fairly confident in the South that if we fall back on the 111956 borderline as the criterion for determining the status of disputed areas, Higlik would, 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 would accrue uh, to the Republic of South Sudan. So we, we have no intention, no desire to use military means to enforce our claims. Is that right? I just wonder if that's the truth, why in recent days we've seen crowds in Juba, in the South Sudanese capital, burning Sudanese flags, and one of your colleagues around the cabinet table, the environment minister, Mr. Gore, telling crowds, we will win Higlig and Abye. Clear implication, through we'll a win them by process. force. We will win them through a I don't think process. that's what he meant. Well, not when they were burning flags all around. No, him. people were agitated because of the actions of Khartoum. And, you know, President Bashir has been calling us names. He has been behaving in a manner that is not befitting uh, a statesman or head of state, for that matter. So people are just sort of frustrated. But uh, it, it, is, it is a fundamental tenet of our foreign policy that will only seek to recover territories that we have lost through peaceful means. Through peaceful means. Exactly. So can you here and now on Hard Talk confirm to me that all of your security forces, whether they be army or police or whoever, will be pulled out of all of the disputed areas? Absolutely. And uh, actually instructions have already been given to our forces, which is basically a police force inside the BI, to pull out. When will they all be out? They will be all out very soon. How yeah. soon? Very soon. Very soon. Well, yeah, but the people on the ground, particularly the civilians in Abyei, who feel that they are currently sort of being besieged from both sides, they want to know when they can expect to see this demilitarization really completed. Well, we have already communicated our uh, desire to the chairperson of the AU, uh, basically uh, stating our full compliance and adherence with the roadmap that has been outlined, and that entails a withdrawal. So. All right. I just wonder if you've learned a lesson here. You, you say that it was never your intention to win by military means, but the fact is perhaps you've learned over the last few weeks that if it comes to a, a shooting match, you're not going to win. I mean, we had President Bashir the other day saying the only language they understand in the South is the language of the gun, which prompted a lot of people to look at the military balance. And although you've got a lot of people in your military forces, you don't have the aircraft, you don't have the tanks, you don't have the heavy, heavy artillery to really compete with the North, and maybe you've come to realize that. No, I don't want to go down the path of ballet course rhetoric that has been used by President Bashir, but the fact of the situation is that we are a very resilient people. We may not have all the tanks, the artillery that President Bashir has. Uh, we have no, no, no desire or intention to, to pursue uh, a military conflict with Bashir. But if a military conflict is going to be imposed on us by Bashir, then I think our resilience will, uh, will enable us to survive. Do you think all-out war is still a possibility? It is a possibility, but I think it is receding uh, in view of the decisions that has just been taken by the AU uh, Peace and Security Council and which we understand uh, will form the basis of a United Nations Security Council resolution. I think, um, uh, I think uh, the well, hope let, of let's conflict talk. Yeah, no, no, All right, so you're saying, look, the focus right now is on diplomacy, not on fighting. Right. All right, let's, let's pursue that a little bit. We've got Tabo Mbeki, the special envoy uh, to this conflict from the African Union, saying that in essence, there has to be, within the next few days, the beginning of a meaningful dialogue between you and the North, and ultimately there has to be a settlement of the key issues, which is border demarcation, territorial dispute, uh, and the oil issue over the next three months. And if there's not an agreement over the next three months, then the African Union will impose a binding settlement. Are you prepared to accept that? Absolutely, and I think credit has to go to the African Union for that. And I think African Union now is beginning to live up to its responsibilities. So uh, you'll be bound by it, even if they disagree with what you've just told me about, for example, the status of Heglig or Abye uh, region, you will absolutely commit here and now to being bound by this African Union resolution. Yes, and we are fairly confident because our cases are strong. Yeah, well, they're very confident in Khartoum too. But the point is not so much being confident you'll win, but, but being quite explicit in saying even if you 
in these terms, lose your case, you will abide by the, all the decisions. Well, I'd like to tell you Khartoum is still dragging his feet on whether to agree to the AU road matter or not. We have already communicated that in a formal letter to the chairperson of the AU Commission that we fully accept the roadmap. Well, you have, Foreign Minister, but some of your diplomats who presumably work to you as, as the boss have said things very different. I mean, one of your senior diplomats in Nairobi, John Andruga, he said to the newswires the other day that Mbeki was partisan and not credible. Well, you can say that the facilitation process that has been led by President Mbeki leaves something to be desired. But you've just said and, you're entirely happy with it and signed up to all of its conclusions. That's why I'm saying that this resolution or the, the roadmap was not worked out by Mbeki. It is the work of the AUPSC, the African Union Peace and Security sure, Council. Sure, but Mbeki personifies the AU diplomatic mission right now. Yes, I mean, uh, we, we would like to see Mbeki work collaboratively with the other AU organs because his, the process that he's leading needs support. And, and we think that what has just been decided by the AU is a shot in the arm for the facilitation process of the African Union High Implementation Panel. Yeah, just a, a final thought on, on diplomacy. The UN Security Council is very concerned about the fighting we've seen in the last few weeks. And they say both to you and to Khartoum, if you don't stop the fighting now, we may well consider sanctions under Article 41. Now, that's not such a big deal for Khartoum because they've lived with sanctions for a long time, but it comes back to my point about you losing international sympathy. If there was any talk of sanctions being imposed upon the new nation of South Sudan, that would be a terrible indictment of your strategy, wouldn't it? I can assure you that we will, we will not be the reason for triggering the, the sanctions under Article 41 of the uh, Chapter 7 of the United Nations. But they uh, will, are will actively considering it as the ultimate punishment if you guys don't sit around the table. So I'm just asking you whether you accept that perhaps looking back over the last few weeks, your strategy did backfire. We have, already, we have always been around the table. I mean, uh, if, if, if you read press statements, it, it, it's very, there is a very clear indication that Khartoum that does not want to talk. And President Bashir has vowed that he would not sit at the table of negotiations to resume talks until he has taught us a lesson. And we have consistently maintained that there's no solution except through dialogue. Yeah, well, okay, so we've talked about the territorial dispute and we've talked about the border and obviously your position in Khartoum is still are quite far apart, but you say you'll accept the, the a diplomatic initiative. Let's talk about perhaps what underpins all of this and that is oil and money. The fact is, is it not, that what we've seen in the last few weeks is the weakness of your new nation terribly exposed because you cut off oil production partly to punish Sudan, because of course they wouldn't then get the revenues from the transits. Um, but in so doing, you've decimated your own economy. Yeah, the closure of oil operations was not to punish Sudan. It was to conserve and protect our own resources. Uh, when Khartoum started uh, confiscating and diverting our oil in early December till late January, we had hoped that this process would stop. Because all the while we were negotiating what would be a fair uh, transit fee to pay to Khartoum. Well, what would be so, fair? So this, this is the essence of it. I mean, let's, let's be honest about what's happened. In, in doing the deal to accept nationhood, Sudan, that is Khartoum Sudan, has seen its revenues fall because it's seeded most of the oil fields, seen its revenues fall by billions of dollars a year. They've got a black hole to fill in their budget. They need to fill it. And of course, one way to fill it is to put, put up the price of transiting your oil to the Red Sea port. Now, what would be a fair price for the pipeline transit of your oil to the Red Sea? A fair price is subject to negotiations, but uh, it's important to point out. Well, yeah, but let, let's talk a ballpark. I believe Khartoum has demanded thirty-six dollars exactly. a barrel. Do you Khartoum's think that's a fair price? Well, it's not for me to say, but I want to know what because you seem to want it virtually free. What, what, it's what are outrageous. What Absolutely. are you prepared to pay? It's outrageous. What are you prepared to pay? Well, we are already paying the transportation costs. And we are ready to pay something that is, uh, is reasonable in light of international standard practice. Yeah, well, so give, give me, I mean, okay, you say $36 okay. uh, per barrel is unreasonable as a transit fee. What is reasonable? Well, the Chadians pay the Cameroonians $0? 41 cents oh, uh, per yeah, barrel. That's what I thought. Yeah. You see, yeah. what you seem to be putting on the table as, as a fair transit fee is, is it less than we a dollar? We have offered $69 and $64 dollars, uh, cents per barrel. Cents? For the cents per yes. barrel for each of the two. Uh, for two pipelines that carry our crew to Khartoum. So they're saying $36, you're saying something like $0.60. Cents. It yeah. seems to me that, 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 that what you're putting on the table isn't going to be realistic. Well, our point of departure is that we are looking for a fair commercial deal. The point of departure for Khartoum is that they have got a deficit that they have to plug in any way, even at our expense.
That's the problem. But they hold the cards because the pipeline that you need to use goes through their territory. So if, if they don't do a deal with you, you can't export your oil. We understand, but the people of South Sudan find it very difficult that they are going to be blackmailed into paying these outrageous sums. And we have already decided that we'll look for alternative but the, avenues to transport our but oil. But if to I the may sea. say so, Foreign Minister, this goes to the sort of viability of your state and your current strategy. Because you know, I've seen some of your ministers talking rather airily about building a new pipeline, maybe through Kenya. That's right. Who is going to invest in the massive infrastructure project that represents when you are possibly going to be at war with Sudan? They have an air force, you don't. They can bomb any pipeline project that they choose to, to target. Who is going to invest in that massive infrastructure project?